as you can see from what he's going to be talking about today, he got interested in studying affection. And actually, a long time ago, when he was a master's student in our department, uh, he left us for the PhD at Arizona, but it was when he was a student here with Matt Parks, he was interested in studying father-son communication and eventually the, commun the affection that can be shown between fathers and sons. It worried me a little bit because sometimes we study the things that are not going well in our life. And then we say, oh, gosh, I hope that he has a good relationship with his dad and this isn't, but in fact he does. So he was trying to model and understand what was going right in his relationship and hoping that that might influence other people's relationships as well as our, our general understanding of affection. But from that time, that early days, he's really built this amazingly programmatic level of research. One of the things I've written about him before is that he scaffolds his research beautifully and that he has a range of questions that he wants to address. And he really thinks about the many studies that he's doing at one time. I'll just point out that Corey had seven publications last year alone, at, and that's um, out of over a hundred publications that he has in his short career. Um, when he came out, when he came up to apply for jobs, he had more on his his vita than I had when I went up for tenure. He's an amazingly productive scholar, but the, the even more important is the quality of the work that he does. He does really rigorous research that, as I said, works together to really answer the fundamental questions about how is it that affection works? Why does it work in the ways that it does? Why is it important to us? What are the various forms of affection? How do different people react to that? Who do we give affection to and who don't? Does it work when we write about uh, affection? Does it, do we need to have nonverbal expressions of affection? So many different kinds of questions, and he's addressed it from many different kinds of angles because he has incredible methodological breadth as well as the depth. And one of the things he's been able to do from this huge amount of work, really, really rigorous work, is to put together several monographs that allowed him to speak to the questions about what does affection mean for us as species, and particularly from an evolutionary perspective. Why does it work the way that it does? How does it tie in with our health and well-being? All of those things really have made a fundamental our, our fundamental understanding of affection really so much greater because of that. Not only does he speak to an academic audience, though, he speaks to a popular audience, and he's written a book where he has taken not only his own work, but the work of other people, and distilled it in a way that he could come up with strategies to help people have more affection and less loneliness in their lives. So he has this desire not only to understand this better for us as an academic community, but actually to let people know this so that their own lives might be better. So that's a pretty awesome set of things. So that's him as an academic, um, and just a couple of things as, uh, about him as a person. One of the things is I'm really, really jealous of how much he travels. So he and his spouse have been to the South Seas, they've been to uh, Ireland, they've been to Australia, they've been to, um, I have several of them written down here, Scandinavia, all of these places with incredible pictures. So he, in addition to doing this work, he travels the world and he's taken students to various places to give them the opportunity to also have different kinds of perspectives. And to, I think, purposely just to make me envious when I see the beautiful <laughs> pictures. Um, he also is, just in terms of sort of general things that I can say about him, um, uh, in addition to being really expansive and, and um, trying to understand the, the kind of bigger world and where we fit, he's also funny, he's deeply kind, and he's extremely loyal. He is always a person that I need to see at conferences if I can get in early enough to get on his dance card because I'm not the only person who feels like he's the, the dearest person to them. Um, we all need to see him. He had a time in which he had a health scare. Um, and this is part of you know, I got my kid a little bit teary. This is a while ago. And I, the first thing that I said to myself is that I can't imagine the world without Corey Floyd in it. Fortunately, we don't have to. Given the amount of affection that he both gives and receives, I think he's going to live to at least 100. So <laughs> with that note, let me t let you talk more about your own research on affection. So I would guess that from time to time, we all have one of those days. And I want to tell you about one of mine in the, the not too distant past. It was the first day of a brand new academic semester. And I was already 
kind of frazzled getting to work that morning because there were not one but two accidents on about the six mile stretch between my house and my office. So I'm already feeling a little bit under the gun by the time I get to work that day. And I'm in my office prepping for my class to meet my class for the first time when the phone rings and it's my doctor with some not very good news. So suddenly my, my mind is elsewhere and I'm sitting kind of stewing and I'm going on the internet, which is not a good thing to do for health information sometimes. And I'm just really distracted when there's a knock on my door and I open it up and it's a student saying, I just wondered if we were gonna have class today. I said, well, of course we're having class today. It's the first day of the semester. He says, I'm only asking because we've all been sitting down there for 20 minutes waiting for you. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'm gonna grab my stuff. I rushed down to my classroom. I walked in, I put down my books, I put down my water bottle, I spilled my water bottle all over my books. And then I'm trying to get the screen down so I can do my presentation. I actually literally dragged a chair over. I'm standing on it, yanking on the screen when one of the students says, you know that's electric, right? <laughs> so I went over and flipped the switch. I'm thinking to bring the screen down and shut off all the lights in the class. So this was all within the first three minutes of meeting a new class, not the best first impression as you might imagine. So by the time I got back to my office after that disastrous uh, day of teaching, I saw one of my colleagues in the hallway and she did one of these like, like looking up and down at me and she said, do you need a hug? And I said, I, I, I can't even tell you how much I need a hug right now. So she gave me a hug there, standing in the hallway outside my office. And you know, it was only maybe 10 or 15 seconds that we stood there um, hugging and it didn't change anything about what had gone wrong in my day up to that point, but it changed everything about the way that I felt. Suddenly all of those individual stressors no longer seemed so problematic. They didn't seem so insurmountable. I could feel my stress kind of melting away. And, you, and maybe you've had the same kind of experience where uh, a hug or somebody holding your hand or somebody telling you that they love you just kind of makes everything better. And you know, as I've reflected on moments like that uh, over the course of my life, one of the things that that really underscores for me is that it doesn't take necessarily a large, significant gesture to have a significant effect on us. I mean, that was a really small, short-lived behavior, but it sure gave me a lot of benefit in that moment. And why something so small, why such a small social behavior can have that kind of benefit has been a question that I've actually pursued as an academic for quite some time now. Uh, and that's what I'd like to share with you today, my research on the importance of pro-social communication. I'll define that term for you as we go uh, and then situate my work on affection within it. But that's really what I'd like to share with you today is what, is it, what does it mean for us to communicate in pro-social ways uh, in our close relationships? I wanna start there and then I'm actually gonna transition into talking in more detail about affectionate communication as one particular instance of that. Uh, and as Valerie said, this is where I've spent the majority of my academic life is in studying its intricacies and trying to understand better Again, why such a small, brief behavior can have important effects for our health and our well-being. And then I'll conclude our time today with just some qualified conclusions. I think some statements that are defensible based on what we know today, but certainly are open to being modified as the communication research continues to mature in this area. I'd like to start with the observation that we as human beings uh, are very social creatures. We're maybe the most social of all the social primates. It's very much ingrained in who we are to belong, to be cohesive, to be social, but that doesn't always mean that we are pro-social. We have as human beings an amazing ability to invest in others, to take care of others, to be compassionate with others, and also to be pretty bad to each other, right? And one of the interesting things about that is that often 
those two motivations can coexist even within the same relationship. How many of you grew up with a brother or sister? And of those of you who did, how many of you have had moments when you have said or thought to yourself, you know, I really love you, but right now I kind of hate you a little bit. Right now I'm not your biggest fan. And the fact that those two instincts, those two emotions, not only can coexist within us, but can coexist at the same time. I both love you right now, and I'm really not very fond of you in this moment, um, is a little bit profound, right? In any other type of relationship, if I, if I felt that way about a friend, certainly at least repeatedly, that person wouldn't continue to be a friend for very long. But there's something special about the family bond that allows it to um, maintain that level of ambivalence at times. So as we think about our instinct to be social, we want to at least acknowledge that that's not always manifested in pro-social ways. And what I mean by that term are the kinds of verbal and nonverbal messages that we use to indicate messages of affection, compassion, altruism, trust, the kinds of communication behaviors that contribute to the development and maintenance and cohesion of close relationships rather than to their opposite. I'll talk about affection as we go, but certainly compassion belongs on this list as our instinct to recognize suffering in others and be motivated to do something to try to alleviate that, or altruism, our instinct to give to others with no expectation of return, or trust, uh, our ability to to feel trusting in others and, and to trust that they're going to be there for us when we need them. These are all instances of behavior that when enacted socially become pro-social because they contribute to uh, our need for inclusion, our need to belong, as social psychologists refer to it. And I have spent, as Valerie said, most of my academic career studying the first thing on that list, which is the communication of affection. One observation to make about affection that I think is actually pretty consequential is that it is both an emotional experience and also a behavior. So I've argued early on in my career that it's necessary to separate affection from affectionate behavior or affectionate communication. The former is really an emotional uh, experience that comprises our feelings of love and fondness for other people, you know, I'm pretty fond of my dog, too. There's any number of entities that we can feel affection for, but that's to be distinguished from affectionate communication, the behaviors through which those emotional experiences are made manifest in our relationships. And I've put in parentheses here a, a point that's actually quite important, which is to say that these are the behaviors we use to convey affection accurately or inaccurately. And here's what I mean by that. As humans, we have, with affection and, and, and many other emotional experiences, um, an innate ability to separate the underlying emotion from the behavior through which it's conveyed. And as it relates to affection, that gives us the ability to feel affection for someone else that for whatever reason we choose not to express. And that may happen, for instance, early in the development of a relationship when I'm not necessarily sure how the other person feels. Maybe I'm wary of being the first one who says I love you in the relationship. Um, and so I may feel the emotions, but I may choose not to convey them. Interestingly enough, though, the opposite is also true, which is that I can express affection that I'm not actually feeling at the time. And there's any number of reasons why I might do something like that. Anybody who's been a a mother or a father or been around children is familiar with that phenomenon. Kid comes up to mom and says, mom, I sure love you. Mom looks down and says, what do you want? <laughs> right? Mom knows, right? Mom's smart. She can see past that. I was interested in that phenomenon specifically, expressing affection that you're not actually feeling. Uh, a number of years ago, I did a, a quick study. I just kind of wanted to see how prevalent that was and what some of the motives were that people were actually trying to serve. Um, so in that particular survey, a little over a thousand college students at schools around the country um, were asked, have you ever 
expressed affection to somebody that you weren't actually feeling at the time, but for some other reason entirely. Now, what percentage of those students would you guess said yes? Yes, I've done that. What do you think? I heard somebody say 100. That's kind of cynical. <laughs> 70. It was almost 90%. It was 88%. And interestingly enough, of that 88%, more than two-thirds of them said that they had done that at least once within the previous month. So it was more prevalent, it was more common than even I was expecting. And the good news there is that not all of their motives, when I asked them, what, well, what was it that you were really trying to accomplish, not all of their motives were selfish or self-centered. A lot of them were very altar-centric, very pro-social. I wanted to make the other person feel better because it seemed like they were having a bad day. Or I thought it was in that moment just something that they needed to hear. Um, and some of them were more relationally centered, like it seemed like we were on their way to maybe having a conflict and I wanted to derail that. Um, and then of course there were some that were very self-centered. I wanted, you know, I wanted to borrow money from that person or I wanted to sleep with that person or whatever. Um, but those were actually in the minority, which I was a bit surprised and happily so. Uh, to see, but it's much more common than, uh, than I even expected. And of course, when we think about the communication of any type of message, uh, it seems like we can easily categorize the forms of messages into those that are verbal and those that are nonverbal. And logically, that's a complete set. But one of the things my colleagues and I realized early on in studying the ways that affection gets encoded uh, is that it wasn't actually a complete set. So we certainly tell people that we love them or write that to them, text it to them these days, whatever it might be. And we show them love in ways that are nonverbal. And I, and I say in parentheses here, direct. Uh, and what I mean by that is nonverbal behaviors that are, are readily decoded as expressions of affection. So in our culture, kissing, hugging, hand-holding, putting your arm around somebody, things like that. What we recognize, though, is that many people were describing forms of affection in their relationships that really didn't fit neatly into one of those two categories, but were actually provisions of social support or emotional support. I tell this person or I show this person that I love them by doing favors for them or by being there when they need me or driving them to the airport at three in the morning or helping them put a new roof on their house or putting the snow tires on their car, not so big of an issue in Arizona, but, um, but, but by providing something of value. And we may be inclined as communication scientists to look at something like that in, in maybe a dismissive way, to say, well, that's, you know, that's not real affection. That's not the same as kissing someone or holding your hand or telling them that, that, that you love them. But over a number of different studies, we found that in many relationships, not only is this the most common means of conveying affection, it's the most valued. And I think often there's a sentiment that it's easy to say you love me, but show me that you love me by the things that you do. So very often, that's, that's much more valued than the more sort of easily decoded behaviors. And I think in some cases, it allows affection to be conveyed in ways that kind of fly under the radar, that are covert, maybe. Uh, and in some relationships, that can, be, that can be a good thing, that can be useful. When I started thinking about affection early on in my career, I was, I was here when I started having these ideas. Um, it struck me that communicating affection is not without its risks. And here's how I had that epiphany. I know it doesn't sound like much of a, a revelation, but um, I grew up in a very affectionate family. I mean, very, we were all over each other when I was growing up. And so, like a lot of people, I sort of assumed that what was true in my family was true in everybody's family. And so I was a very affectionate person. When I was in school, um, I was, you know, very huggy and very demonstrative. Um, my friend Scott is here today, who I went to high school with, and he probably can attest to that. And what I discovered is that not everybody likes that. Right? I mean, some people do. Some people respond very positively to affection, and other people tell you to go stand over there and leave me alone. Right? And that's when I realized that there are risks involved in that practice. There are risks involved in expressing affection, which at the time I did not understand. That was absolutely perplexing to me. 
How could you not want affection? It's the best thing. But clearly, um, people saw some risks in it, and, and maybe first and foremost on that list is the risk of non-reciprocity. You know, have you ever told somebody that you love them and they say back to you, thanks? <laughs> <laughs> Awkward, right? And even more so because there is such a strong expectation of reciprocity with a behavior like that. So that's always a risk. And again, perhaps especially in new relationships where I don't necessarily have the confidence that the other person may respond in kind, I'm kind of putting myself out there. Uh, and that can be risky. That can cause people uh, to choose to leave express, uh, affection expressions unmade. There certainly also is the risk of misinterpretation. What do you mean you love me? What does that mean? What are you saying to me? And I think many forms of affection can be interpreted in ways uh, that are counter to the intention of the encoder. So somebody might interpret a purely platonic expression on my part as a romantic gesture or vice versa. Uh, and as the nature of the behavior becomes more ambiguous, of course, the risk of misinterpretation increases. There certainly also is a risk of social or cultural censure, among other things, Affection is a very rule-governed behavior. And what's appropriate in some relationships is not appropriate in others. What's appropriate in some contexts is not appropriate in others. And certainly from culture to culture, we see variation in what's considered normative or acceptable. So if we are um, ignoring those rules or simply unaware of them, then that's a, that's a third risk that we incur some sort of censure from the receiver of the affectionate message or, or, or from others in the context. And then I think finally to add to that list has to be the risk of disease transmission, right? I mean, I think intuitively we all understand that we don't go around kissing people when we have the flu. But many affectionate behaviors are very intimate in that way. Kissing or being in close proximity certainly, um, certainly involves a risk that if we are experiencing a communicable disease, that it's going to be transmitted to others that we love. Um, those are certainly not all of the risks, but I think that when you think about them all together, you kind of have to ask yourself, why do we do this in the first place? If there are so many different risks, if there are so many different rules, things that we have to think about, why be affectionate? Why is this something that has characterized our species as part of our behavioral repertoire? And I think that's a fair question. I'm gonna offer in response to that question what may strike you as an exaggeration, what may strike you as uh, a particularly bold claim, which is that I have come to believe that affection is a fundamental human need. We don't have very many of those as human beings, right? We need to eat, we need to sleep, we need to drink water or vodka. <laughs> um, we need to breathe oxygen. You know, these are things that we have to do as human beings to self-regulate, to maintain our, our health, to maintain our survival. And of course, nature has built into all of those needs automatic reminders, right? So if we don't eat for a while, we get hungry. Uh, and that motivates us, it reminds us, oh, it's time to eat, or we don't sleep and we get fatigued and that reminds us uh, that we need to, to, to meet that need. And I think the built-in reminder for our need for affection is the experience that we call loneliness. That we feel the sensation of, of disconnection, of lacking an adequate social inclusion. And of course, we all feel lonely from time to time. Episodic loneliness is very normal. Maybe you started a new job and you don't know anybody, or you've moved to a new city, or you just don't have your friends around. Um, so from time to time we feel that way and, and, and that's particularly normal and, and it's fine. I, I think in many ways it can actually be beneficial because it motivates us to reestablish those bonds. It's when loneliness becomes chronic and, and, and particularly uh, severe uh, that it really becomes a detriment to not only to our psychological health but very much to our physical health. There are many, many ailments that are either caused by or at least exacerbated by uh, experiences of lonely, loneliness. And I think that when you think about our level of sociability, 
uh, as human beings, the need to which um, we, the, the need that we have to be social uh, as humans, I don't think it's that big of a stretch to call affection one of our most important and fundamental human needs. One sort of line of argument that, that can bolster that claim um, really comes from the very first days of our lives. You know, we as human beings are born in, into what I like to refer to as an advanced state of dependency. Uh, you know, many other species, of course, are up and walking within minutes of their birth or are hunting or foraging within hours or days uh, and they become self-sufficient in relatively short order, right? As human beings, we measure the path to self-sufficiency in decades, not in hours or days or weeks. Uh, we are in sharp contrast to most of our cousins in the animal kingdom and one of the implications of that is that for the first several years of our lives, we are absolutely dependent on the willingness of someone else to meet all of our needs. And so if I'm just thinking rationally, I have to ask myself, exactly why would anybody choose to do that? Like, why would you choose to have a child and make the kind of investment that rearing that child requires. You probably know that every year the federal government estimates the amount of money it costs to raise a single child just through age 18, right? It doesn't even include like UW tuition, <laughs> right? And it's now hovering right around a quarter of a million dollars per child. Like just think what you could do with that kind of money. <laughs> so, and that's just the financial cost. I mean, there's also lost opportunity, lost sleep, the wear and tear on the body, marital discord that comes with having a brand new baby. I mean, all sorts of costs get rolled up into that one endeavor. And yet, the willingness to make that investment is absolutely essential to the survival of that infant. An infant who cannot get somebody to invest in it is an infant who will not survive infancy. And so what is it among us humans that motivates us to engage in that level of investment and to do so willingly and in many cases repeatedly? And of course the answer to that question is love. Why do you do those things for your kids? Because you love them. You love them. You could not fathom not laying down your life for their welfare. And I think if you think about it in those terms, it's really not an exaggeration to call affection a matter of life or death without something as significant as love and affection for a child to motivate that equally significant investment, that child does not survive. When we think about it in that context, when we think about it in those terms, affection goes from being something that we enjoy, something that we prefer or value in our relationships, to something that we absolutely need and require. And that need doesn't go away, of course, when we emerge from infancy. Throughout the rest of our lives, we have, again, what social psychologists refer to as a need to belong. We need to be invested in and identify with a social community in some way. And there are detriments associated with failing to meet that need, what some researchers refer to as skin hunger. I'm hungry for love and for affection. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go, but this is a need that characterizes us throughout the life course. And of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that each of us needs the same level of affection, right? Any more than each of us needs the same amount of sleep or the same amount of food. But we all need some, right? We all have a, a non-zero need. Uh, for those fundamental characteristics in our lives. And so at some point along the way, I started thinking about how affection feels good to us. You know, I was thinking back to that encounter with my colleague in the hallway, and when she hugged me, it felt good to me. And it didn't just feel good psychologically, it didn't just feel good emotionally. It felt good physically, which says to me that there's something that transpires in the body when we give and receive affection with people that we care about. 
And that got me wondering then, if affection feels good to us, and if it's such a fundamental need, is it possible that it is good for us in the same way that sleeping is good for us or eating is good for us? Um, and I started to think about, in particular, is it good for us because it can help us counteract some of the negative effects of stress? That was the context in which I was having that exchange with my colleague. That small gesture did a lot to restructure the way that my body, in particular, was managing the stress of everything that had gone wrong in that particular day. So I started thinking about, you know, if it can help us manage stress, can it actually improve our health? Is affection is something not only that we enjoy, but that is actually good for us. And in the last maybe 15 years or so, this has been my major question. I'm not going to go through a, a whole series of studies with you and and give you details. I want to give you a bigger picture uh, look at some of the things that my colleagues and I have found, beginning with some of its connections to mental health. Now, of course, there are multiple ways we can measure affection in a person's life. And um, one way that we often do so is to measure the amount of affection that they give and receive within a particular relationship, like their marriage. But it occurred to me a, a number of years ago as well that people probably also have a set point for affection. You know, I, I describe myself as a highly affectionate person, uh, which means that irrespective of the particular relationship or the particular context that I'm in, I tend to be more affectionate than average. And so I wondered if it was maybe like a personality trait, like some people are more extroverted or some people are more conscientious than others. Uh, do we have a trait or, or set point level of affection. So that's been my, my second strategy for measuring it, uh, is to measure it in that way. Irrespective of relationships or context, some of us are highly affectionate, some of us are in the middle, some of us are very low on that scale, and it's an individual difference with some, with some stability um, across the life course. And so the, the findings that you see on this slide are all based on correlations with that manner of expressing affection. Uh, and we find, as you can see in the plus or minus signs between, in, the, in the parentheses, uh, either positive or inverse relationships between that trait level of expressed affection uh, and multiple indices of, or of mental well-being. Certainly happiness is positively related. People who are highly affectionate are less lonely. They're more socially engaged. They report less chronic stress. You may or may not be familiar with the term alexithemia. This is a personality construct that really indexes a, an impaired ability to interpret emotion displays. So somebody high with this trait would have a difficult time, for instance, decoding a, a smile or decoding a, an angry looking face. Uh, and, and even to understanding their own emotional experiences, as you might imagine, that's inversely related, as is depression. And also the likelihood, the probability of having been diagnosed with a mood disorder or an anxiety disorder. So categories of psychopathologies. Now, of course, these are all correlational findings. None of them necessarily implies that there's a causal relationship between affection and these outcomes. And I've come to believe that if there is, it's probably a circular causal relationship. That affection can reinforce my happiness or it can reinforce my social engagement uh, and so these things become reciprocal in that way. That's my speculation, at least, based on these. But I think that in many ways, the more provocative findings that have come out of my lab and, and out of my research program have had to do with physical health. So again, when we look at affection as a trait, when we consider people's set points, we can look at that in relation to various markers of, uh, of health in the body. And so you see here, summaries of findings from multiple studies uh, in my lab. And among the more interesting ones are that compared to less affectionate people, people like me, people on the high end of that continuum, um, for example, react with less arousal when we encounter stressful events. You may not believe that after the story I opened with, <laughs> but compared to somebody lower on that scale, on average, my arousal to a stress-inducing event would be less, would be dampened, would be buffered, to use the technical term. And I will recover more quickly from acute stress, largely for that reason. 
I don't have as exaggerated a response. So I, I take less time to return to baseline, to return to homeostasis uh, after engaging with a stressful experience. People who are highly affectionate, by and large, which, by which I mean according to most indicators, also have greater immunocompetence, greater immune function. That's not without exception, but the preponderance of the evidence uh, from our lab and others that have studied that connection shows that people um, have a more responsive immune system, better able to, for example, fight off pathogens or help the body recover after uh, a pathogenic invasion. Uh, they have lower blood glucose. That may strike you as kind of an interesting thing to measure if you're non-diabetic, um, but you may or may not know that blood glucose or blood sugar level in your body is responsive to stress. So as, as you're encountering stress, your blood sugar level goes up, and so people with higher amounts of affection in their lives maintain their blood glucose at a lower rate. And then the finding I'm going to talk about in a little more detail here in a second is that they have better cortisol rhythms. And cortisol is, you may know it as a stress hormone. It's something that also gets elevated uh, in the bloodstream when we're encountering stress. And it does a number of important things for our bodies uh, to mount a defense to that stressor. But in the absence of an acute stressor, over a 24-hour cycle in our lives, over a, a, a circadian rhythm, if you want to think about it that way, uh, our, our, our cortisol levels follow a pretty patterned response in which they are highest shortly after we wake up in the morning and they drop pretty sharply throughout the morning into the early afternoon and then they kind of taper off but continue to drop and drop and drop until about midnight and then they start that cycle over again. And it turns out that it's not the average level of cortisol in our bodies but the amount of variation in our cortisol levels over that 24-hour cycle that is indicative of a healthy ability of what's called our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, our HPA axis, to be responsive to stressors when we encounter them. And so this got me wondering whether people who have higher levels of trait affection have more differentiated cortisol rhythms over that 24-hour period. This was the very first psychophysiological study that I did in my lab. There were 20 healthy young adults. I know for communication scholars, that seems like a ridiculously low N. Um, for this kind of work, it really isn't. And, and one of the reasons why is that the level of measurement error um, is, is so reduced compared to many of the methods that we're more commonly employing um, in communication research that you don't need as big of an N to appreciate significant effects. So these people took four saliva samples over the course of a normal work day. They could choose the day, but we asked them to choose a day that was pretty typical in terms of the kinds of things that they were doing. Uh, they took a sample shortly after they woke up in the morning, one around noon, one around 4 p.m., and then one right before uh, they turned in for the night. And there's a lot of research that, that shows that even, even just three samples over the course of the day uh, can adequately index the entire diurnal rhythm. Uh, that, that entire 24-hour cycle. They completed measures of their trait affection expressed and also their trait affection received, the amount of affection that they typically receive from others. The reason I was interested in doing that is because I wondered whether the benefits of expressing affection were actually just the benefits of the affection I received in return, kind of masquerading that way. And so I wanted to actually be able to control for that. And once I did, there was a pretty strong relationship between trait expressed affection and the amount of variation over that diurnal cycle. Just for illustration's sake, I've mapped on uh, this graph that you see, these were the cortisol levels of the most affectionate person in the study. The person who scored highest on that measure of trait expressed affection. And this is, act this is exactly what you hope to see if you graph your own cortisol levels over the course of a day. This is a very healthy cortisol rhythm. Now contrast that with the rhythm of the least affectionate person in the study. Basically flat, right? This is enormously unhealthy. This indicates a very impaired ability of the HPA axis to be responsive to stressors. This is often seen in cases of chronic 
stress. People are dealing with a chronic health issue or uh, unemployment stress or discrimination stress or things that are, are, are with us that are significant and chronic often have that kind of long-term effect um, on, on the HPA axis. So, I mean, quite striking. And one of the things you notice is that the average level of cortisol is actually higher for the high affection communicator than the low affection. But as I mentioned before, that's not really a good indicator uh, as much as this diurnal rhythm and the variance in that rhythm is uh, for marking a healthy ability to respond to stressors. So this produces what um, health psychologists refer to as a stress buffering effect, or it can, such that when people encounter um, stressful events in their lives, affection and things like social support and emotional support provide that person with um, a protective effect, such that they will still react with a stress response, but not as exaggerated a one, and will we'll have a, an easier time recovering. And I started thinking, as I was kind of reflecting on, on, that, on that model, on that process, I started wondering whether another hormone may be implicated as a mechanism, may be partly accounting for variation in why affection and, and related experiences can have that kind of stress buffering effect. And so I went to another hormone called oxytocin. This has been getting a lot of press in the last few years, whereas we call cortisol the stress hormone, many people call oxytocin the love hormone or the cuddle hormone or something like that. And it is elevated in the bloodstream uh, when people are sharing affection, when people are sharing touch, even non-romantic or non-sexual forms of touch like massage uh, can elevate our level of oxytocin. And oxytocin, I think, can probably be best described as a feel-good hormone. When it's flooding our system, we feel um, calm and pain reduction, and it just, it's a feel-good hormone uh, in terms of the way that we experience it viscerally in our bodies. And so I started to wonder whether reactivity of that hormone may be a mechanism for why something like affection could have a stress buffering effect. In this particular study, we had 100 adults. They were extensively pre-screened on inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's just something that you have to do uh, when you're measuring these kinds of markers. We asked them both to keep a one-week diary measure of the affectionate behavior that they exchanged prior to their day in our laboratory to get sort of a state measure uh, of the affection that they've been exchanging recently. And then they also um, reported on their trait level. And when they came to our lab, we subjected them to uh, nearly an hour's worth of activities whose sole purpose was to stress them out. And um, my grad students had a lot of fun with this. They, they, got, they got like almost disturbingly good at stressing others out. Uh, I think some of them really rather enjoyed it. Um, but, it was, but it was for that purpose intentionally to elevate their stress level. And we measured their cortisol levels at the time in order to ensure that uh, we were documenting that increase. And our interest is, was in what was happening to their oxytocin levels in the wake of that stressor. Our speculation was, even though this probably sounds a little counterintuitive given what I've told you, that actually people who had more affection in their lives, either as a state or a trait, would actually have more pronounced increases in oxytocin in response to the stressor than people with less affection in their lives. That doesn't sound right, but we wondered if maybe what was happening is that for people with a lot of affection in their lives, oxytocin was sort of coming to the rescue in order to dampen and help them recover from the stressful experience, to arrest that stress response in a way that it didn't for low affection people. And in fact, that's exactly what we found there was a very pronounced um, association between both state and trait levels of affection, both how much affection I exchange with people typically and how much I've exchanged just in the previous seven days, positively predicting an increase in my oxytocin levels in response to a stressor. And that's simply our speculation about why that might happen, is that it, it's providing a benefit 
to high affection communicators that is not shared by their low affection counterparts to arrest or degrade or antagonize uh, the stress reaction that they were having. So just one study, that's, that's speculation on our part based on that finding, but I think that's an interesting question for the future, trying to identify not only what the patterns are between affectionate communication and health, but what the mechanisms are, what's responsible for those patterns. And that leads me to some qualified conclusions. And of course, they're going to be qualified because, you know, tomorrow or the next year or somebody else's lab is going to come along and prove me wrong. Uh, but that's okay. That's the gig, right? That's what it means to do social science. I think one of those quali qualified conclusions has to just be that affectionate communication is ubiquitous uh, among human species as a form of pro-social communication. You know, I talked earlier about how it varies from culture to culture and even from time period to time period in how we communicate affection, but not in whether we communicate affection. Our tendency to do so, and I would argue our need to do so, are cross-cultural, are cross-temporal, are innate, I would argue. And some of the interesting work that we're doing right now um, is aimed at trying to identify what are some of the genetic antecedents of that set point, of that trait affection level. I don't believe it's entirely environmentally determined. That makes me a little bit of a heretic in a discipline like communication, but that's the way it is, right? And some of our studies have actually shown some promise such that we now understand that the genetic um, contribution to something like trait affection level is non-zero. Right? It doesn't mean that environment's not important or influential. It absolutely is, but it's not the entire picture. So I think this is something that we can safely claim as a means of showing affection and certainly as a means of contributing to our need to belong. You know, affection serves a number of purposes for us that are unrelated to our health, simply including our ability to form and maintain close relationships. And that becomes very important to us given uh, how social we are as a species. Oops. I think we can also show that um, affectionate communication is associated with mental wellness and with physical health. There's so much left to learn about these things, and among those questions are questions of causality. We have found in a few different experiments when instead of measuring affection, we've actually manipulated it, that we can actually affect outcomes um, related to health and wellness uh, at both the physical and mental level. One of the more interesting studies I think I probably have ever done uh, in my career, and, and it's methodologically very, very simple, was uh, a study in which the experimental participants uh, were gathered together and asked over the course of the next six weeks simply to kiss more in their romantic relationships. Just however much you kiss now, just like, you know, ramp it up a couple notches over the next six weeks. And so I kept emailing them over that six week period, like, are you kissing? <laughs> smooch, smooch. <laughs> and we were looking over time uh, at changes in, in some of their blood chemistries and some of their uh, indices of, of mental wellness and optimism and satisfaction with their lives. And we found that increasing kissing independent of other um, alternative hypotheses that we could control for uh, produce some significant health benefit. As an aside, I will say that's the only study I've ever done in which I had people after the study was over write and thank me for letting them be in the study. And actually it wasn't no, so much the participants, it was their partners. <laughs> thank you for getting my wife to kiss me more. Like she'll volunteer for any study that you want. Um, <laughs> But when we've, when we've taken an experimental route like that, we've been able to document that these are not purely correlational associations, but, but ones that do have some causal elements to them. You know, I'm a social scientist, I'm not a policy maker, but one of the things that all of this makes me worry about are social policies that have the effect of curtailing this kind of contact uh, between people. And of course, we see those in school environments and in the workplace. And you know, by and large, I think those policies are well intentioned. I mean, everybody wants to protect children from sexual abuse or protect workers from sexual harassment. 
Uh, there's good intention behind policy like that, but I have to wonder at times whether we have taken kind of a baby with the bathwater approach and gone maybe a little overboard um, by instituting sort of uh, zero contact policies in, in those kinds of environments, especially in school environments. You know, I don't teach school children, but I can imagine being a school teacher and having a child in front of me in distress. And I can imagine the amount of dissonance that I would feel knowing that I couldn't reach out and hug that child. I mean, we all need affection, but children especially need that. And I just wonder, I have to wonder kind of about our collective sanity when these zero tolerance policies seem like good ideas to us. I was reading not too long ago about a case in the Midwest of a middle school student who was expelled from his middle school, not for fighting, but for hugging the teacher who broke up the fight. And I kind of wonder how we, you know, all sort of lost our minds a little bit when we think that that's an appropriate policy. I think if anything, my research underscores the fact that we don't just prefer affection, we absolutely need it. Now, none of that, of course, is a prescription for you to go out and start hugging people on the street, right? This is not that kind of a behavior. That's not something that is going to contribute to your health. That's something that will contribute to your incarceration. <laughs> um, so not a particularly good piece of advice, but in our close relationships, um, I think we can say with some certainty that there's great value in the affection that we exchange with people that we love and care about. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Corey. Okay, we have a half hour for questions, so feel free. Yes, sir. Um, how, how good do you think people are at self-reporting uh, affection levels, like with uh, like the affection diary? Like I know in uh, like uh, diet or exercise science, they have they they use a lot of like the self-report stuff, and it's been like kind of uh, people aren't super good at like act like reporting on what they eat or or what they do. So I'm curious if you if that's something similar with affection, and if so, do you think people over underestimate? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, we're always cognizant of measurement issues. I think that there may be motives to um, under or over report on something like exercise or food intake or alcohol intake that, that don't necessarily apply to reporting on affection. Uh, and of course there's going to be some measurement error in both directions I would, I would assume. Um, I think so much of it has to do with the precision of the measure that you're using, that you're having people fill out every day. Um, and I think that to some extent, the more precise you make the measure, the less measurement error, but also the more opportunity to miss some behaviors that might actually count for me as affection. So if I asked you to simply count the number of times you get kissed tomorrow or the next day, um, I suspect you could do that with a relatively high level of accuracy. And if that's the only behavior I care about, uh, then I think that's probably okay. But as we talked about early in the presentation, we do a number of behaviors that mean affection exchange to us that I would be missing by making my measurement strategy that precise. So it's a give and take. Yeah, but, but always an issue. Yeah. If your point of view is that uh, affection and giving affection <coughs> is pretty much innate and part of our species and who we are, how do you explain a hermit or uh, a loner, yeah. people that are just more comfortable not being particularly close to others? Sure, I explain it just as an instance of individual difference. Okay. Right? We can array ourselves on a continuum, um, perhaps not only in terms of how demonstrative we are, but how much we need that. You know, it brings to mind for me something like attachment theory, where we all have a need for attachment, but we vary significantly in the strength of that need. And you have people with a dismissive attachment style whose needs for inclusion are met adequately by a relatively low level of interaction with others. 
And so to people you know, on the high end of that continuum like me, I, as an individual, find it difficult to understand that. Um, but just as some people are highly extroverted, others are highly introverted, I think about it in exactly those same terms. Yeah. Yes, sir. A few years back, I did uh, some foster care with young people from chaotic homes. And you know, listening to you, I find myself thinking about what is the process by which a young person can, uh, as you say, get into those circular processes of developing their capacity for affection uh, and sharing affection. Yeah. We have to go with very tight, rule-based interaction because they have a lot of, a lot of luggage. But I'm sure. They got yeah. well. They got better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I would speculate that so much of a person's ability to engage in or to um, sort of enter that kind of relationship um, has to do with the level of comfort that they have with affection, and that's certainly influenced by their upbringing um, and by their culture, even as we look, for instance, at the difference between contact and non-contact cultures. Um, we can see some of those environmental influences shaping a person's predisposition for affection. So I would argue that the predisposition is more innate, but is certainly shaped by the environment in which they are raised, particularly in their foundational years. But that's speculation on my part. I, I don't, I don't, that's a good question. I, I don't have a better answer to it. Yeah, it's provocative though. Yes, sir. So let's say you get called in, you do a three hour affectionate uh, communication workshop. Mm -hmm. You're already sold on the health benefits. You got three hours. What do you, what do you offer there? They're looking for a skills workshop. How can they get better at affectionate communication? Uh, what, what has the highest dividends? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that either. Um, it's an interesting question, and it's the question that when I speak to, especially when I speak to non-academic audiences about this work, uh, that I encounter the most often from people, how can I get my husband, wife, girlfriend, kids, father to be more affectionate with me? And, and it's often, it's often asked in the context of marriage. How can I get my husband to be more affectionate, my wife to be more affectionate? And, and, and my initial response to that question is always some form of it's not something that you can force. And I've had people, and it seems to me more women than men over the years say to me, you know, I've tried everything to get my husband to be more affectionate. And I'm ready to just put my foot down and demand it. <laughs> and I say, well, uh, good luck with that. Um, now, what I say is I, I understand why it feels like or seems like that would be an effective approach. If you feel like you've tried everything else that you can think of, but believe me, it won't be. For the very reason that we were talking about, you have to have a comfort level with affection in order to engage that behavior comfortably. Because if you don't, or if you are exchanging affection with somebody that you don't have that kind of relationship with, then affection goes from being a health-promoting behavior to be a stress-promoting behavior. All right? I mean, we probably all had that experience. Somebody puts their arm around us, and instead of feeling good about it, we feel like it's creepy. It's icky. It induces a stress reaction in us. Exactly the opposite of what people in that state would be trying to accomplish with the other. Um, so I advocate for them uh, talking about what affection and exchanging affection means to them. And often the outcome of that kind of exercise is that they discover about their spouse um, that their upbringing was not conducive to that kind of behavior. And that happens from time to time. People come into a romantic relationship with very different set points. One's much more demonstrative than the other, much more comfortable with it. And for the other person, it becomes a stress-inducing activity. And I think it's important to begin with by understanding that so that I know if I want to encourage that kind of behavior in another person, 
we need to find ways of sharing affection that are not going to be stress-inducing. So maybe that person doesn't like holding hands in public, for example. And if that's all affection means to me, right, if that's, if that's all I'm after, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this person to hold my hand, you know, come hell or high water, um, then I'm sort of as much to blame there as the partner because I'm not conceptualizing a broader range of behaviors through which we might convey our love for each other. So it's finding a behavioral repertoire that is not going to be stress-inducing for that partner, and then I think doing things that reward that, um, that reinforce that. I've never done that kind of workshop uh, that you're describing, but if I were going to, these would be among the strategies uh, uh, well, my that I would employ. Not, less, not so much how do you press gain someone else into doing this, but if somebody wanted to get better, how, how would they? But I'm taking my time. Like skill building. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think, that, I think the point in, in large part works in both ways. If, I, if I'm somebody who has difficulty showing affection, at least according to a certain behavioral repertoire, you know, I'm not comfortable saying I love you, I'm not comfortable kissing in public or whatever, uh, then for me I also need to recognize that affection can be much broader than that behaviorally. And if something has value to me and value to my partner, and we can agree and understand that when I do this thing for you, I'm doing it because I love you, in order to show you that I love you, then that allows me to develop an alternate behavioral repertoire, right? Because ultimately what matters is that I'm encoding the sentiment and that it's being decoded by the person that I care about. The behavior is almost secondary. It's just a mechanism. It's just a channel. So it can be hugging or it can be kissing or it can be something like, um, changing the oil in your car when it needs it. And if it's done out of love and it's received that way, then I think in large part our mission's been accomplished. It may not be perfect, it may not be ideal, it may not be exactly what my partner wants, but it's better than what we have now. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure who was first, so I'm gonna go here first and then back there. Um, this is a, a bit related to that question. Sometime earlier on you're talking about separating out people's behavior from their feelings. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, do you also measure that? I mean, are there people who uh, say that they feel affectionate, but they don't express it very much? Is there a different health effect? Or people who express affection even if they don't feel it, are they still getting the health benefits? You know, that's a great question. The truth is that I don't measure that very often. I measured it early because I wanted to understand to what extent those were orthogonal experiences, to what extent did they overlap. Um, but my focus has tended to be primarily on the behavior rather than on the emotion. As a communication scholar, uh, I've been more interested in what happens when we behave affectionately, almost irrespective of what the underlying emotional experience is. And that may not be, a, that may not be the best choice methodologically, but it's where I've tended to go. So I don't have a good empirical answer to your question. My speculation would be that some proportion of the variance in a benefit, a mental health benefit, a physical health benefit, uh, does require some underlying valid emotional experience of love. And some proportion of it does not. Some proportion of it is resident in the behavior itself. And there's been a few different studies that, that provide some support for that kind of speculation. Um, some in which people uh, receive affection from others that they actually have a close relationship with, and some in which they receive affection from a stranger who they don't have any relationship with. And it's certainly true that we benefit more by a hug or a hand-holding from somebody that we care about but we benefit more from those behaviors from a stranger than when we don't receive those behaviors at all, unless they cross that threshold to where we experience that behavior as a threat, right? So think about when you're in the hospital and uh, somebody comes in and holds your hand just to comfort you. You know, you don't need to have a personal relationship with that individual in order to benefit from that behavior. So that indicates to me that some proportion of the variance is really resident in the behavior irrespective of the underlying emotion. But again, that is just speculation. Uh, 
Back in the corner. Um, so you talk mostly about uh, certain health markers for um, affection as a trait or characteristic. Do you look at any of the ways in which affection is socially organized, which is to say, you know, by gender, class, family background, etc. I mean, you sort of gesture to it at different points, but I guess I'm very happy to accept your premise. You know, it's very reasonable that affection is central to being human. But I imagine that what counts as affection and how it manifests is really context specific. Absolutely. And so I'm wondering, do you have anything beyond the sort of medical markers that you're looking at to be able to say something about the social order? Right. I did early in my career. Before I, studied, before I started studying its health benefits, I was interested in questions very much like the ones you're raising because back then we didn't know much about affection as a human behavior. And I think it needed to be sort of mapped in that way. What are the social and cultural and environmental influences that really account for variance? And everything that you mentioned belongs on that list. So just take trade affection level, for instance. Every single study that has found a sex difference in that behavior has found that women are more affectionate than men. And that measure is not behavior specific. So it's not that women hug more or hold hands more or kiss more. It's that they see and are seen by others as being more demonstrative of their affection than men are virtually without exception. And, and there certainly are family influences, there are cultural influences like the difference between contact and non-contact cultures in both the amount of affection that is normative and the specific behaviors through which it's conveyed. So everything that you mentioned is on that list and were I giving this presentation 15 years ago, that probably would have been what I would have focused on more. Um, I think those provide us some important indications of things that are, are necessary to account for. But interestingly enough, they don't always moderate the level of health benefit that's associated with affection. I'll give you just one example, uh, a cultural example. Years ago, um, I had a colleague from China pose the question, if China is much more of a low contact culture, people are much less demonstrative of their affection, at least in public, in China than, than Americans are, does that also mean they benefit less from affection? Uh, and so we did that cross-cultural comparison and certainly found that at, at a mean level, there was a, a hugely substantial difference in levels of trait expressed affection in China versus in the US, but their correlations with all of the health markers that we looked at were nearly identical. So even though the mean difference was substantial, the association with benefit was virtually identical. I think those are important things to consider and, and just, I haven't studied those as, you know, that haven't been the focus of my research for some time, which is why I didn't really include them in the presentation. Yeah, uh-huh. So I'm wondering about the mechanisms here. So the Three factors are verbal, nonverbal, and social support. And I understand with social support, the link between the various forms of social support, like affirmational, informational, provides people experiencing stress with greater resources that allow for better coping mm -hmm. and management of stress. Like mm -hmm. that process I get. But I'm a little bit curious about with the verbal and nonverbal. Um, expressions and forms of affection and communication. What is your thought about the mechanism through which this nonverbal and verbal behaviors then link to these various stress reduction related health outcomes? Yeah, it's a great question and we know little about it. Um, in the nonverbal realm, one of the patterns that we've seen pretty clearly is that uh, health benefits, particularly those related to stress, uh, tend to be the most pronounced for nonverbal behaviors that are tactile. So where there's actual touch involved, hand holding, kissing, hugging, putting your arm around somebody, as opposed to other nonverbal behaviors like smiling at somebody or winking at them or you know, things like that that don't involve contact. So that suggests to me that, that part of the mechanism is uh, is actual tactile stimulation and perhaps what it does to us hormonally, for example. Um, 
none of that would explain uh, the mechanisms behind, behind verbal communication. And you know, we can go very abstract and say that the reason that those kinds of behaviors matter to us is because they feed our need to belong. They make us feel included. They make us feel safe or loved or whatever. Yeah, and those kinds of experiences emotionally can certainly have, say, hor hormonal correlates uh, with them as well. Um, but it's a terrific question. And you know, my research so far has been so focused on identifying what are the health connections and where in the body are they, which physiological systems, for instance, are implicated in those kinds of social behaviors, that the question you're asking is sort of further along in the evolution of uh, my research. So, I, so I, I don't have a great deal to, you know, to say in response to it. Um, but it's clearly a consequential question. Yeah. Anything else, Laura? Thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. Oh, you're very welcome. You. Yeah, you're very so, welcome. in theory, you can consume too much food. In theory, you can consume too much sleep. Affection? Yeah, yeah. My theory proposes a um, sort of a range of tolerance that each of us has. And when we receive too little, we suffer. And the theory actually proposes that we can suffer by receiving too much. Now, the higher end of the continuum is something that I haven't personally studied, but some of my former graduate students have kind of taken up that mantle and tried to figure out what are the problems associated with excessive affection, when I get more than I actually want or need. Um, one of the first studies that they did in that line of research looked at helicopter parenting. So you have a child who's got this helicopter parent hovering around them, giving them way too much attention. Uh, and their speculation, their hypothesis was that that experience and the extent to which the affection and attention they received from their parent felt excessive to them would actually be negatively related to many of the same kinds of benefits. And they found that to be true. Um, so we've done a lot of research on the lower end of that continuum, on affection deprivation. Uh, and, and there's still much more to learn about that. But it's the higher end that in some ways is a little bit more provocative because it's much less intuitive, right? It seems like affection is such a good thing that you would always want or need more than you get. But I don't think that's true. It goes back to your question and sort of in a way, as when you think about it, conceptualize it as an individual difference, my needs may be much greater than the person sitting next to me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're infinite. I still can feel overwhelmed, right? right? And, that, and that still would be at least theoretically detrimental rather than beneficial. Yeah. Belly. It seems like part of that has to do with we have multiple needs at the same time, and one of those is for autonomy. Mm -hmm. It seems that too much connection could violate that. It's going to depend on how far you are toward wanting connection or autonomy, right. but that that could explain it. That could change it over time as well. Certainly. Yeah, certainly. When people become enmeshed, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and feel not only that they're overwhelmed, but they, but they have no escape from that, right? Then that excessive attention can begin to, begin to feel like a real burden. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> it's a little love coming your way. I feel good. <laughs> Anything else? Other questions? I think you have a kind of more philosophical question. Sure. And it's something I thought about with some of the touch research. And you alluded to this here, too, that everything that you just said makes so much sense. And at the same time, affection when it's not wanted, inappropriate, mm -hmm. has such terrible effects. It can create so much stress, too. Mm -hmm. So just as you, you spend so much time thinking about it, sort of philosophically, how do you, how do you work with that concept of the pro-social nature of the exact same thing that can be so antisocial? Yeah. You know, unlike many communication behaviors that we engage in, conflict, self-disclosure, et cetera, um, Affection, by and large, is a behavior that we reserve for a pretty narrow range of our relational experience, right? Um, you know, I may self-disclose to the stranger sitting next to me on the plane, but I'm not going to kiss that person or hug that person 
Uh, probably. Um, <laughs> you know, we reserve that kind of behavior for relationships that are very positive. And uh, sort of to come back to the question that was asked earlier about the connection to the underlying emotion, I think that's not a, that's not a fluke. That's not a, an accident of evolution uh, that we do that. Um, but it does imply for us then that when we go outside of that range, affection can become kind of a different animal. And in my theory, I talk about ways in which I think affection benefits things like our ability to um, have reproductive success in our lives, our ability to survive even because of the resources that it, that it embodies for us, but that it can also threaten those things. And a good example of that would be a sexually harassing behavior uh, where I feel like, for, for example, my safety is, is under threat. Uh, by somebody touching me or interacting with me in a way that doesn't make me feel safe or doesn't make me feel um, th that's not welcome. And so what you're delineating here is, is a really fundamental categorical difference in the use of this behavior in what I would think of as its proper context and the use of this behavior in a context that's improper. Where, where we sort of haven't evolved that behavior for a context that, that doesn't have some underlying positive emotion and, and relational history uh, characterizing it. And so to me, then, it, it's not at all surprising that it could be stress-inducing or, or seen as a detriment to our well-being in those contexts. It would be surprising if that weren't the case. And I think we know something about that, which is why I've tended to do my work over here, because we've known less about not just whether affection can be beneficial to our health, but how, in what ways, through what specific pathways, and in what physiological systems. That seemed like a greater deficit in our knowledge than why does it stress you out when somebody creepy is putting their arm around you. Um, but none of that is to imply that this is unimportant, right? Or certainly part of many people's social experiences. Yeah, and very detrimental. Just to kind of go off of Valerie's question, have you ever looked at um, inconsistent affection um, in the sense that sometimes people use affection like in a, uh, as a power thing, or I'm going to give it or I'm going to take it away? And um, is it? Have you ever looked at the difference between inconsistent affection versus like not getting it at all? You know, I haven't. Uh, years and years ago, Beth Lapoire did, looked at, she called it nurturing, inconsistent right. nurturing. Uh, and she theorized that parents can engage in inconsistent nurturing with their children as a form of control. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to dole out affection when I think it's going to serve my purpose. I'm going to withhold it when I think it's going to serve my purpose. Um, and that inconsistency in and of itself, kind of keeping the child guessing, you know, which version of mom is going to show up today, um, was, a, was a control mechanism. She wasn't theorizing and, and studying it in the context of affection specifically, but what she was theorizing about, I certainly would characterize as affection. Uh, I don't know that much has been done with it since then, and I think her interest in it was more of almost characterizing that as, as pathological, as a pathological parenting behavior, that it wasn't something to be encouraged, uh, that it was actually very detrimental. And I certainly can understand how it could be in terms of fostering something like trust or, or dependability, a uh, sense of dependability. I certainly would think that something like that would contribute to an insecure attachment style, as an example. So the work that's been done, I, I think, primarily has been hers. It's not something that has been of interest to me. Uh, empirically. Anything else? Thank you, everybody.